love you too. It's good to be in church tonight. Worship the Lord together. In spirit and in truth. And the old hymns we've been singing tonight and those courses really touched my heart. We're living in the last days. Amen. How we need to prepare ourselves for the coming of God. For the coming of the Lord. For Jesus Christ is going to break the clouds of glory. And going to come for his church. I want to be a part of that church. Amen. I don't know how much longer me or anyone else has on this earth, but I know one thing. Whether I go through the grave or whether that rapture takes place and I'm still here, I'm looking forward to him breaking those skies wide open. And the shout and the blowing of the trumpet, the archangel, and the skies are going to roll back like a scroll. I believe in that day we'll be able to look straight into heaven, see the throne of God. The skies, the universe will part. And God will come down through Jesus Christ, his son, and receive his bride back to be with him. What a glorious time that's going to be. Well, we thank the Lord for the week and a half of summer. Now we're, we're back to reality again. My body is just so messed up. I, I can't seem to, to get used to it. I, I went out yesterday and I got chilled and just felt like I didn't know what was happening to me. And I looked down and I didn't have a coat on. And it was 20. So I went back in like I should have done and put a coat on. And, and uh, it's hard to get our bodies to function correctly sometimes with that type of weather. But anyway, I'm glad that God gave us some wonderful weekends. We could be having... Uh, two or three foot of snow and couldn't get to church at all. So aren't you glad we've got open Sundays so we can come together and worship the Lord together. Uh, it's good to be here tonight. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me. I have two portions of Scripture that I would like to share. First of all, John chapter 4. This is my main text. I have another text I'd like to read in conjunction with it, which is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55, beginning with verse 1. Isaiah 55, beginning with verse 1. Before I do that, a lady in our church wrote this, and, and I'm not going to uh, make her feel uncomfortable by naming her, but I thought this was nice, and she wrote it on such a nice uh, thing, and these computers these days do such wonderful things. I assume a computer did that. At any rate, uh, the, first, the first little saying here is called image. And uh, it's about Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. J, just because I'm human. And what that means is, I think, if I'm uh, interpreting her writing correctly, is Jesus came and took on the form of flesh. So that he could know how we feel and how we go through things. E is for easy becomes so hard. Isn't that the truth, folks? S is for simple things like love that we take for granted and hate. U is for unleash the hold within. And S, set us free from human bonds that we may be more like Him. Amen? Jesus. Then there was one on the back. It's entitled, His Love. And uh, the words are Christ. C-H-R-I-S-T. C is for the crucifixion that all of us know so well. H is for our heart we will give. For him to dwell. R is for the rough spots in our lives each and every day. I is for our instincts in knowing when and where to pray. S is for our Savior that came to die for us. And T is for thank you we need to say every single day to him. Christ, our answer to life's problems. Amen? Christ, God's answer 
the lace prop. Thank you very much, sister. That was wonderful. And uh, I'm going to take that and put it up in my office. It's put in plastic and so I can turn it over once in a while and read the other side. I thought that was so nice. If I was to use the theme this evening, and by the way, next Sunday morning, if God so deems, I was going to preach last Sunday morning, but the Holy Spirit deemed that that should not happen. And uh, I'm always, uh, if it's a Holy Spirit, I'm always happy to stand aside and let Him do His work. But we do believe that the Word is what brings us strength and growth in our church. And so we thank God for his, his, the teaching of His Word and the preaching of His Word. The harvest is ready. Next Sunday morning, I'd like to preach on identification. I identify. I identify. It's very, a very important message. And uh, pray about it. We're preaching some messages coming up soon on the last days. Uh, will Israel survive? Talking about the last days of the church. We have some messages that God has given us. We want to be preaching these in the near future. So I think the church ought to be looking for the coming of the Lord. We, we cannot sit back and take it easy. We have got to be looking for His coming and be alert. So John chapter 4 tonight, beginning with verse 35. I'd like to read the verse to verse 38. Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I send you to reap that wherein you have bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labor. Turn back with me, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. I'd like to read the first six verses. These scriptures are all from the King James Version this evening. Isaiah 55, 1 through 6. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Verse 3. Incline your ear, and come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. And you know, this is speaking of Israel, but it's also a type of the church. So in these last days, before I read the last verse here in verse 6, you got to remember that the work of the church is that of reaping. A lot of times, I guess there has been people that have sowed, but the Bible doesn't depict us as so, as much as it does reapers. Jesus Christ, he said it himself, he was the reap, he was the sower. We are those who go and reap the harvest that has been sowed. Yes, we have people that go into areas just like this town that had no Pentecostal message. And Preacher Long came and preached and, and uh, introduced the Pentecostal message to the Mountain Horse area. And they spread all over. There are still churches that are, that are having services today all around in, in West Virginia, in Greene County, all around this area that are because this church was started here in Mount Morris. And then the word spread. And people went out of this church and preached the gospel and started other churches. And, and, uh, and this area has now a strong Pentecostal message. 
And we thank the Lord for that. Verse 6, six says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Heavenly Father, bless your word tonight. We, we want your word to go forth as you have laid it on our hearts. That's a, a tough task. And Lord, I pray that as it has imprinted itself on my mind, help me to be able to translate it to our people so they will feel what I feel and feel what you have caused me to feel about this message and about these last days. God, open up our hearts tonight. Wake us up, Lord, and help us, Lord, to stay awake, not necessarily in this service. I mean, Lord, in our Christian lives. Help us not to slumber or sleep, for as sure as we do, we may be left behind. Help us to be awake and alert. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I didn't mean in that prayer, not for you to sleep. That's your own, uh, whatever you wish. But <laughs> uh, we trust that you'll stay awake while I'm here. Anyway, you know, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ready. Jesus has declared the world ripe for the gospel. 2,000 years ago, Jesus began to transmit this message. Go ye into all the world. Uh, Matthew 28 and 19. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And coming the first Sunday night in March, again, we're going to have a baptismal service here in our church. Sunday morning will be a membership service. And it's going to be a great day here on the first Sunday morning of March. And why, why did we do that? Because Jesus declared for us to do it. The sacraments are important. It's important we take communion as often as we will. The cup and the bread. It's important that we're baptized in water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus declared for us to do these things. It's important. Baptism won't save us, and that's something I run into every single day. I was at the hospital last uh, last week, and as I walked down the hall, a young man came running out, and they've been to our church a couple times here in the last two Sundays, and, and uh, I don't think he realizes that, uh, he, I think he's been Catholic most of his life, and he doesn't realize this is not a Catholic church, although I'm sure our worship is somewhat different from, a lot different from theirs, but... But he hollered, he said, Father Tomlinson, Father Tomlinson. <laughs> well, if he hadn't said Tomlinson, I wouldn't know who he was talking to. But when he said that, I said, that's got to be me. I don't know any other priest named Tomlinson in this area. So I turned around and I went to him. And, you know, I could have uh, corrected him, but I didn't. I just went to him and, and he told me what was on his heart. And, and we both knelt there in the hallway at Ruby and we prayed together and he was all right. But he's been coming here, him and his wife and family, and, and we're believing God to do great things in their lives. How many can say amen? You know, sometimes we, we, we run into things that people don't understand. We're living in the last days, and we get so bogged down with greed. We get so bogged down with greed that we have no time to be real. And I believe God is calling for the church in these last days to be real. To touch the lost. To love the lost. To reach out to the lost. To have compassion on the lost. I've learned that the hard way. I've learned that the hard way. You don't have to make man religious. He already is religious. Anywhere you go in the world, from the most populated area of the world to the most desolate parts of the jungle, you'll find that everybody you meet believes in some kind of God. They worship some kind of God. Man is so created. He thinks about eternity. He has built in him the capacity for faith. The capacity for love and loyalty. And for beauty and even for righteousness. Everywhere you see it, 
even though much of it is, has nothing to do with our God, with the God. Maybe the God they have is a rock, or it's an animal, or in, in India it's a cow. But everywhere they are trying to be better. They're trying to be more righteous. They're trying to get to that whatever it is in the sky. Now how they get that message, I don't know when the Bible has never been preached to them. They've never heard about Jesus. And yet they believe there's a life hereafter. How do we believe that? How do people believe that? Because God put that instinct within every human being to worship. I think the church of Jesus Christ should take advantage of that. How many can say amen? People walk by us every day and we don't know whether they're Christians or not. And in most cases, we don't maybe have opportunity. I would recommend that you stop everybody you meet on the street and inquire of them whether they're a Christian. But I believe the Holy Spirit could give us vision and could give us insight into people that we walk past. Have you ever felt like uh, you knew in a sense that you needed to talk to somebody when you walked past them or walked into a room or went into some place to buy food and for some reason you felt I need to say something to that individual. Have you ever felt like that? I have a lot. But then I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person I talk to everybody. And uh, Rose, she gets very uncomfortable with me sometimes uh, when she's with me at the hospitals and stuff. I talk to everybody. And uh, a lot of them, times I don't even know who they are. But if they look good, I talk to them. No, I'm just kidding. God forbid I get into the mess I got in last Sunday. So we're, we're not going to say too much in that area. You see, I believe there are starved souls, lots of them. Hordes of them. Millions of starved souls. There are degraded souls. But the religious nature is there. You can't make a man believe he's a dog. I don't care how much you try. Eventually they're going to realize that they're not. Let alone make them believe that they're an ape. Satan tried that on the prodigal son. And that didn't last long either. It didn't take him long to realize he wasn't a pig. He knew the decision to make. And he said, Father, I have sinned. You see, folks, everybody, that's why we preach from our pulpit. Everybody has to say those words. Everybody has to say them. I don't care who they are. Everybody has to say, I have sinned. They've got to repent. Well, what a, a good message that was this morning. And the very first point was a point that must go with us everywhere. We must repent. Not only once, but every day. For what we say, what we think, how we might hurt somebody, we must repent for those things. I believe that this man, this prodigal son, knew the decision that he had to make. Listen to me. You preach the gospel, and there is a ready market out there somewhere for somebody to hear. That's why in my main text back in John chapter 4 and verse 35, it says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. But behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. Let me tell you something about Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 6. I can't buy or sell religion. Now there's a scripture that tells me exactly that fact. And today, yet today, people are commercializing religion. They're even trying to commercialize Christianity. And God forbid that we ever get caught doing it here. Because you can't sell or buy religion. It's a free commodity that Jesus has made uh, aware for all people to take. 
and receive in all areas of the world. You see, I help to reap that which has been sown by Jesus, and that's my work. This evening, for just a few moments yet, would you follow me as we look at the harvest is ready, or the harvest is ripe? Number one, I believe the young people are ready. When, when is the heart of a child ready? Have you ever thought about that? When is a child's heart ready? You know, you take a man that is raised in church. It's not hard for that man to come to God if he's in the right situation. But a man that's never heard about God, never heard about Christ, it's difficult for that individual to give their life to the Lord until somebody is witness to them. And so we got to look at children this way too. Now, I believe that young children, small children, babies, and innocent children are exactly that. They're innocent. Nowhere in the Bible do I find that Jesus ever condemned children. If you can find it, you tell me. Nowhere can I find it. And, but he did say this. These children are the kingdom of God. Don't forbid them to come unto me, for they make up the kingdom of God. But you know, there comes a point in life when everybody has to make some type of a decision. I look back through this audience and I see, I see not only young people, but I see folks. I've been here, uh, is a generation probably, is that considered these days 10 years? A 40. I haven't even been here a, a generation. Uh, 10 years is uh, a decade. That's it, right. A generation is a, a long, long time. Isn't it? But in this period of time that I've been here, I have been here long enough to see now, right now, the second generation from the first generation that was here when I came. The third generation is coming from that family. That is really something. I see people here tonight that used to come and run around this church in their diapers when I first came here. And now you're grown, thinking about family, if not with a family. I've dedicated some of you. You don't believe that, do you? Well, you're quiet. You really are. You folks are really into it this evening. Pretty so important. Thank God. What about a child? You see, there is no arbitrary age of spiritual readiness. We say about 12 years old, but the only reason why we say that is because Jesus came to the temple during his time of growing up. And when he came to the temple, he, he spoke with such intelligence and wisdom to the church leaders that people have taken that, that must be the age when children become accountable. But not so. I know children that have preached as an evangelist at the age of five. I knew a five-year-old evangelist young lady who had to stand on a chair to preach a revival camp service. Five years old. So what am I saying this evening? I'm saying tenderness favors acceptance. And Jesus said, unless we're willing to come to him as a little child, we probably will not come to him. It'll probably be impossible for us to get to him. So what I'm saying is, yes, our youth, our young people, they're ready. For, they're ready to be brought in. We have a job ahead of us today. We live in an age when things have changed so much, it is tough for us adults to reach young kids. They think differently than we do. I remember when I was a child, my parents took me to church. I sat across the pew, and I sat with my parents, and I didn't move. That was accepted. I did that. I didn't always go to the altar when they went, but I sat in my pew most of the time I slept. That was my life as a kid. 
And then little by little, I started entering into God. And the older I got, these things started grabbing hold of my mind. And I began to learn, but today, kids are coming in the church that have never heard about God. Teenagers that have never been taught. And many of the parents don't care if they're ever taught. And so it's left to the church for an hour and a half, once or twice a week, to reach these kids and to get them ready for the ministry, especially ready for the coming of the Lord. We've got ourselves a big, big job. How in God's name do we do it? I think it comes down to the point of realizing the harvest is ripe. Everybody's got to take part in ministry to our children, to loving them. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says, And that from a child, in my Bible, it has in parentheses, and that from a babe, Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make me wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The child is ready, parent. I still think that children respond best to the gospel of any age group. I still believe it. The young are ready. Number two, I believe the masses are ready. We have churches that are centering all their attention on themselves, on their own building, on their own resources, on their own services. They have no missions outreaches. They, they touch nobody else. They don't even go to the nursing homes in their own town where they are. They just center all their resources on their own congregation. And they explode and they grow, but everything is right there. That's all there is. That is not what the Bible is teaching. The Bible is teaching, go ye into all the world. The masses are ready to hear the gospel. Somebody in this room may be called to be a missionary. Let me tell you, it's not an easy thing these days. It's a hard thing to go on the mission field, especially in the assemblies of God. First of all, you have to be saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. You, you had to be a Christian, you and your husband, for a certain amount of years. You had to be raised in the church. You have to go to uh, Bible college or take college, uh, Bible college education and, and have a good, uh, solid scriptural education. You have to pastor or preach for at least two years before you can go to the mission field and the assemblies of God. It's a hard thing to go to the mission field in this church organization, but it's needed. I, I read not long ago, whether pastor got this or not, I'm not sure. But I read not long ago that uh, pastors are getting very, very skimpy in the church today. There's a need for pastors. You see, young men go into the ministry, and they have all types of aspirations, all types of visions of what the ministry ought to be. They take a church, or they take a, a, a ministry, and and they go to work for the Lord, and then it doesn't turn out the way they envisioned that it should turn out. And their hearts are broken. And you'd be surprised how many young men and women are leaving the ministry because they, they can't cope with the heartbreak of not seeing anything done. We're living in the last days. You see, many people can go in the field and could call themselves reapers. But there are people that know how to reap. And then there are people that trample down the grain. You understand what I'm saying? So it is very cautious and very important that as we prepare ourselves for this last day, and I believe we're living in this last day revival, if that's what you want to call it. I don't. I, when I speak of last day revival, I don't speak about something happening just at this altar. Uh, that's great for a church to have revival. I believe the last day revival is reaching the lost for God. Seeing people saved and filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've been seeing that here in this church. We've got the proud of it right in this service tonight. 
And while people are coming in and getting saved, can I be square with you? There are other people that have been sitting in the church for years that are dying. Drying up and blown away. God help us. God help us. How can the harvest be reaped unless everybody be capable to reap that harvest? You send the wrong person into that harvest field and they'll trample the grain and they'll destroy it. The right person will reap it for good. You know, I've always said this. If I can touch one person per day, I don't, I'm not sure I do that every day, but if I can touch one person per day for the Lord, whether I don't, I don't know whether they ever get saved or not, but if I can touch them, I feel like I've done what the Lord would have me to do as a pastor. If I just touch one. And I had somebody in my office a few weeks ago, and they were so frustrated. They said, I'm ready to pull my hair out. Everybody around me on my street, everybody's lost and undone. They don't want God like I do. What am I going to do, Pastor Tomlinson? I'm going to go crazy. I said, you've got to lay that burden at Jesus' feet, and you've got to start just doing one at a time. Just, just meet one person at a time. If everybody in the church would do that, we'd have to build another church in the next year to hold everybody that would come in here. That's how it grew. The masses are ready. Sometimes we are convinced that church work is a long and tedious chore. Every catechism must be followed. Every platform should be adhered to. And the platform should be asked, what do people want? And churches are falling. I'm being very candid with you tonight. People are falling into this everywhere. There is always some new type of scheme out to make a church grow. There are schemes that thick that you can read over that will tell you how to make a church grow. But let me tell you what the Bible says. The scheme is, what do we do? Do we, do we, we become uh, seeker friendly and I'm not against that. I spoke about that one time, not long ago. But I, I, we need to be cautious that being seeker friendly doesn't make us world. When we become seeker friendly, then we start adhering to the whips and, and the, the woods of the world instead of letting them taste and see that the Lord is good. And so just because people say, I want this, and I want this, and I want that, doesn't mean you give it to them. We need to preach the word. And this is what Jesus told us. And this is what Paul told us in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. They want, I believe there are people in the world today that really actually want righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. There are actually people out there who really, really want that. And don't want to have their ears tickled and their tummies rubbed. Four months of religious arguments are the very last thing they need. They are so ready to harvest. Don't trifle with analysis. Let the first gospel song, I believe that at church services, let the first gospel song say, come. Let the first words of the prayer say, come. The common people heard him gladly. Mark chapter 12 and verse 37. The common people heard him gladly. I was bread and life and drink and life and door and shepherd. That is what people, I believe, are looking for. I agree. Our churches are filling up and thank God for it with people from all tracks of life. Doctors, professors, colleges. Fifty years ago that wasn't so. When you came to church, 95% of all the people who walked into church were farmers.
or blue collar workers. Today there are all types. But I've asked the Lord, and I hope I can do it. And it's happening here, and I'm so glad for it, where people are coming into our church from all walks of life. Doctors, everything. I say, Lord, help me not. Don't take me wrong, folks. I'm not the most intelligent individual in the world, and you know that by now, if you've been coming very long. I'm not the most educated individual in the world as well. But I've asked the Lord, Lord, help me not to be intimidated by what's in the pew to alter what's in the Word. Help me not to be intimidated by that. My job is to preach the unadulterated Word of God. This is the last day harvest, and I believe there is. And in this church as well, we have a great church here. And in this church, there, our people are hungry, I believe. Don't you believe that? They're hungry to hear the gospel. Last Sunday morning, you should have seen it. If you, I know if you were sitting in the pew, you couldn't see. And probably you were bawling with everybody else. But I'll tell you, as I walk through this audience, I prayed for people. I prayed for teenagers sitting in the back pew who haven't been to this altar in months. Crying and weeping and sobbing sitting in their pew and we hadn't even preached. The Holy Spirit was working through this audience and doing a powerful work. How many believe that's what's going to make the harvest? We've got to create a foundation in the church today that says, be ye ready for in such an hour as you think not. The Son of Man When Jesus comes, is he going to sort through all this stuff that we're doing to try to find us? Or are we going to be ready on the trumpet? Now that's just my old-fashioned thinking, but you're not going to change me. That's exactly the way I think. That's exactly the way I believe. Wycliffe appealed to the serfs at Leicestershire. Luther preached to the peasantry in Germany. Wesley exhorted the colliers of Kingswood. You've got to get to the people as quickly and as directly as possible. Jesus was saying this, don't say yet four months until the harvest. Look around you. The harvest is ripe. And the first bad storm that comes along, if you don't get out there and reap it, it's going to destroy it. How many are with me? It's going to destroy it. There'll be thousands of people go to hell and not one preacher, not one deacon, not one trustee. Not one Sunday school teacher will have taken time to go to them and witness to them. Because it's yet four months until the harvest. Why should we hurry? You see what I'm saying? I think we need to pull down the buffers. I think most of them are mental reservations anyway. Ecclesiastical myths, fantasies. Let's make the service simple. Let's get to the man with the dinner bucket. Once again. You didn't get that, did you? Let's get to the man that carries the dinner bucket to work again. And let's tell them Jesus loves them. Jesus cares. That's why the street beatings are important, Brother Twig. He was in a hospital. He couldn't take care of it. We did try. It didn't work out. That's why the street meetings are important, because there are people in this town that are going to hell every minute. Somebody's got to reach them. It isn't enough to come to church here and have our little hunky-dory thing. 
We've got to get out of these walls and we've got to reach somebody that needs Jesus before this end of the age comes. Do you, do you, are you with me tonight? Do you believe it? Matthew 11, 25 says, I thank thee, O Father, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Millions are tired. Forgive me for my terminology. I wish, you know, I'm not really qualified to teach a lot of young preachers, but I have been. <laughs> it's really, it's really, it's almost laughable, Brother Waters. How many young preachers I get to teach, and they got degrees, and I have nothing. <laughs> I don't know how in the world I ever got there to do that, but I wish I could get every young preacher coming out of Bible school, and I could set them in front of me by the thousands. Not that I'm that great, but I could tell them this one thing. Here's what I'd like to say to them. Millions are tired of the slop popping to them. I know that's strong. Millions of people are tired of the slop that is offered to them. And they want something real. I believe trivia and dribble layer like pollution till the soul struggles between death and reality. The demand for credibility is inherent. Man needs to trust as he needs to breathe and sleep and even procreate. Preach Jesus and man will find security. Preach the unadulterated word of God and people will be able to go to bed at night and go to sleep. Preach the unadulterated word of God and people will come to the altar and get saved. The harvest is ripe. Who will go? Listen to me tonight and I'm going to wind this down before too awful long. I, I took every bit of good I've said so far down the road. There seems no life whatever in the garden. Have you noticed? It's not going to be long. Back home when I was on the, on the farm, if we didn't plow in the fall, we always plowed early spring, probably the end of January, as soon as the fall came. And it didn't matter if it snowed on it. After, we would plow the ground and, and, and just not not prepare it, just turn it over. This way all the, all the bugs and all the larvae and all the stuff that's down in the ground is turned up and has a chance to freeze and, and kill all that larva and get that ground ready to, to get ready to plant. And then here comes March. Here comes March. Everything looks dead. Twice dead. But it is not really so. You drive down the street of Mount Morris and you say, what a pitiful place. I'm talking about the gospel. You know, folks, not very really few people, not very many people from this town attend this church. Compared to the amount of hundreds of people that come here. It's pitiful. What in God's name are we going to do? Before Jesus comes. How can we reach New York City if we can't even reach Mount Morris? That's right. Everything looks twice dead, but it is not really so. Under the surface, the seeds are swelling, the roots are full of ferment. Within the bark of the trees is as much movement as there is on the streets of New York City. Every fiber is tingling with force. The sap is coursing. We can't see it, but it's happening. All that is needed is a sprinkling of warm rain, a breath of south wind, and a kiss of warm sun. Everything breaks forth. I believe we need sensitivity. It reminds me, back in Genesis, if you have your Bibles with you, turn back to Scripture, Genesis 28 and verse 16. It reminds me of Jacob. And Jacob awakened, this is verse 16, 28, 16. You might want to take this chapter and read it. It's a powerful verse, powerful portion of verses. 
And Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Surely the Lord is in this place and I know it. How many times does God deal with us and we don't even know he's around? Tomorrow when you get up to go to your job, I know you won't feel like it. Tomorrow morning's an early day for me. I'll get up at quarter to four. I'll be at the hospitals by five. I'll work all day, get back in by six or seven tomorrow night. It'll be a work day for me just like it is for you. I'll get out of bed. I'll look in the mirror and say, who in God's name are you? But in the middle of it, is an opportunity for me to say, God, are you going with me today or aren't you? Am I going to do this alone? Or are you going to go with me? When you go over there tomorrow, and I'll try to hunt you down tomorrow, Brother Stout, I'll try to hunt you down over there while you're there getting your first treatment. God's going to go with you. Do you believe that, Brother Stout? God's going to go with you. You're not going alone. When he goes over there tomorrow, he's going to get a cancer treatment, but he's also going to be in the harvest field. And Jesus may have some doctor or somebody for him to say to them, I got faith in my God. Greater is he that lives in me now than he that lives in the world. See, number three. I gotta move it. I'm, no wonder you gave me a lot of time, Pastor. I gotta get done. The skeptic are ready. First the youth, then the masses. The skeptic are ready. Hear me just for a moment. The real question that they pose behind the scenes is this. Do you the church people, do you church people really mean it? Do you mean what you say? Are you really interested in the down and out? Are you? Let me, let me pose this question to you. There was a day when if a homosexual would have come in the bathroom with me, I'd have, I'd have mashed his arm between two doors. But since then, I've led six to the Lord, had their funerals, and they're in heaven. Do you really mean what you say? Or is your sickle you go to reek with a death row? See, the atheist is of the same flesh you are. The homosexual is of made of the same body you are. Has the same mind you have. The only thing is, Satan has him entangled. Now what if all we do is debase them and run them out of the church and not let them find Jesus? And every homosexual in this country and around the world will go to hell instead of being saved. Say, Pastor, it sounds to me like that you agree with homosexuality. No, I don't agree with it. I hate it. I hate that filthy sin. But I don't hate the people Amen. who participate. Amen. The Bible says Jesus said, be in the world, but don't be of it. How can I win somebody to Jesus if I can't shake their hand? We better look up. Time is closing. You say, I wonder when homosexuality started, Pastor. It started before Jesus' time. It was during the times of the Romans. It was very rapid in the, in the, among the Romans. Way back in the Old Testament. Paul told about it. Not in many places, but one place, first, Roman, first chapter of Romans. He was very candid. Now, 
But Paul's message was always this, although he condemned sin, he always opened the door to the harvest field. That was Paul's life. You see, Paul didn't get saved to just sit around and watch. Paul got saved to start churches. Am I right? In Asia Minor, all the way up through the country of Turkey, he started every church that was ever started up there. He is the one who started it. And what I'm saying to you tonight is, the skeptical were out there. The unwanted. The people we don't like to be around and feel uncomfortable with. They're out there. Do you think the only people that we're going to get saved in Mount Morris are the people that shave and comb their hair and wash their face and put a suit on and come to this service? My God, if, if that's what we're going to do, then we just won't close the doors. Because we're all going to get all done. <coughs> this church was not put here to be a love nest. This church was put here to meet the needs of the harvest field. Am I correct? Number four. The mission field's ready. I hear it all the time. I hear preachers say it. The in interventionists especially cry, wait for civilization in third world countries. Wait for commerce and government. What are we doing over there? Spend an assembly of God money in Iraq. We need it right here. They're saying, wait for civilization. Wait till people start acting like they're civilized. Wait for commerce and government to come to third world countries. Then we can go in and win them for the Lord. Jesus said, don't say wait for months and then come to harvest. It's ready now. I don't know what God has equipped you for. And I'm going to close with this. I, I got, man, I wrote so much stuff. Why do I have such long sermons? Does anybody, have anybody ever figured that out yet? I just talk a lot, I guess. <coughs> See, somebody told me this uh, not too many years ago. Said it's too long, it's too large of a leap go over in those third world countries in missions and try to expect those people that can't even read and write to become Christians like we are. It's too big a belief. I remind you of the caterpillar. How many ever watched their progression? I mean, I haven't been able to sit and watch them, but uh, they're, a, they're an ugly looking brown mass, some of them. And the next thing you know, how it happens, I don't know. It's one leap. And they're a beautiful butterfly. Can I say this, brother? Stop. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's a good way to get permission. And don't give me time to tell you whether you got it or not. He came up to me this morning. It's nothing bad. He said to me this morning at the altar, as we prayed. He says, what a transformation. God has done in my life. You see, you don't need to wait for civilization. You don't need to wait for an industry. When Jesus changes, he changes. Once an old man, a dirty man, a dirty woman, a dirty child, and now a new person, a new creation in Christ. Appreciated the message this morning for another reason. Once we start for Jesus, you've got to keep going. Don't be in now in the church. You're no testimony at all. If you come in the church for a month or two and go out, then you come back in and act the same way you did before you went out. People aren't going to accept that kind of foolery. Don't do it. It only makes a fool of God. If you're going to serve the Lord, serve the Lord. If you're going to serve the devil, serve the devil. But don't try to serve both. Strong words, I'm sorry. But it's the truth. 
I'm going to put it this way. If I'm expected to live right for God and be here every Sunday and live right, everybody else ought to be expected to do the same. There are no emissions. Well, Fred, close. Number five and last. The time is ripe everywhere. We'll have a missionary this Wednesday night. He'll talk to us about the need of reaching the gospel in every country of the world with every bit of literature we can possibly, possibly saturate into this country. Wonderful. But believe it or not, the United States is ripe Amen. for harvest too. Do you see, since this country was started, there now is a whole new generation. The people and the thinking is no longer there that made this country what it is. There's a whole new format among humanity. People are humanistically uh, styled in their minds, in their thinking patterns. They don't care about the neighbor. They, they want to, the dog off of your, your property. They, they don't want you to step. My twin brother, I told him, I really got on him. It wasn't long ago, somebody walked across the corner of his yard, and, and the guy just made a quick turn across his yard. Ted walks outside and hits him right in the mouth. Then you do it again, you'll get it twice. There's a road to walk on. You walk on that road. I said, Ted, man, you need long suffering. Don't just, don't just drop somebody. Although we'd like to sometimes. There's church people we'd like to drop. Testament represents the church as a reaper, not a sower. We're not represented as sowers. We're reapers. Jesus Christ is the sower. I am authorized to go to the child, to the worker, to the abandoned, to the pagan, to Mara. I may, I'll not say who it is. I've made arrangements to go to the home of, a, of an individual. They need Jesus. And they've invited me to come. Never been in church before in their lives. Right here in Mount Moore. How many will pray for me that I'll reap some grain tomorrow? Amen. Amen? See, that's what it's all about. And with everything else I do tomorrow, hospitals, praying for the sick, praying for those who are going into surgery, going into homes and praying for people who are sick with flu and all these other things and doing all these other things that preachers do. The one most important thing that I'll get done tomorrow is to reach into the fields and reap the rain before the storm comes and blows it down and it will never be This isn't the kind of message that makes us dance and yell right around the church. 
But I hope this is the kind of message that will wake up our church and make us realize the harvest is right. Who in God's name is going to go and seek to take care of? If this church is to get filled, hear me now. There are people that move in. We love to get people in from everywhere. But my last priority is to fill this church with people from other churches. My first priority is to fill this church with the unsaved. You see? And if other folks move into the area and come, we just welcome them and we love them and, and we cherish them. But I want to see these, I want to see these people that nobody else care about. I want to get a chance to love them. All right? That right, John? Somebody's got to care about somebody. Am I right? If nobody cares about nobody, then nobody's going to be the heart. God help us today. Let's turn the corner in evangelism in Mount Moore's Gospel Tabernacle. Ask the Lord tonight around these altars tonight as we quietly pray for ourselves. Say, tonight, God, I'm going to get down to business with you. I go to work tomorrow. There's a harvest field there. I go to visit a relative or a friend. I go to the store and buy groceries. There's a harvest field there. Will I take time to say something about Jesus to somebody? bow your heads a moment just for a second. Is there someone here? I don't think so, but you know, I, I can't judge that. That doesn't know Christ as their Savior. Is there one person here that is not saved? If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I just encourage you to raise your hand and say, I need Jesus. Would you do that? If there's one person here, because that's our first priority. If not, family, I'm calling upon husbands and wives. I'm calling upon young people. I'm calling upon grandmas and grandpaps.